We're leaders. We're leaders, leaders again. again. We are leaders again. Thank and you. This community is leaders. So good morning, Chair Williamson, board members, Chief Evans, um, members of the uh, Hill Regional Police, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, thank you very much for this invitation um, on behalf of the United Way, uh, BCAN, the uh, United Way's Black Community Advisory Council, the FACES Collaborative. Um, I'm pleased to be here with my colleague, um, Sharon Douglas, who is our Director of Community Investment and who leads our community engagement and our diversity and inclusion um, plan and uh, policy development. And we are joined by Len Carby, who is the chair of United Way's Black Community Advisory Council, and the coordinator of our Black Community Advisory Council, Mame Deborah, as well as members of the FACES Collaborative, uh, BCAN, members of the Black Community Advisory Council, and other supporters um, today. Um, United Way is committed to promoting inclusion and diversity throughout the United Way, but also throughout our community in the broadest sense of the word. And in fact, embracing diversity and inclusion is one of our six guiding values that guides all of our work and all of our decision making. And so as a result of that, we do have a very comprehensive diversity and inclusion plan for the organization and it's been in existence for more than 15 years. And as a result of that, one of we are champions with Peel Regional Police on Canada's only diversity and inclusion charter, um, and um, with the school boards and a number of other community organizations and leaders. And one of the strategies within our diversity and inclusion plan was the creation of four councils. The Black Community Advisory Council, the Chinese Advisory Council, the South Asian Advisory Council, and our Millennial Advisory Council. And the purpose of these councils is twofold. We wanted to have authentic engagement with members of these communities to understand what their priorities are from a human services perspective to ensure that United Way was making the right decisions and right investments to improve outcomes for individuals and build stronger communities. And we also wanted them to know that they had a place at the United Way table. We wanted them on our boards of directors as volunteers as advocates and as donors in our community to help us achieve our goals and objectives. And one of the very, very first things that members of the Black Community Advisory Council told us as a number one priority was to improve outcomes for all black youth in our community. They wanted to ensure that black youth had higher graduation rates and had higher employment rates. And we, that we were reducing crime and that we were reducing unemployment. I mean, unemployment among our black youth is at 29%. That's higher, 10% higher than other youth in our community. So this was, this was a real priority and we were committed to working with them. So um, as a result of that, immediately the United Way did one thing. We invested more money with Big Brothers Big Sisters to increase the number of black mentors with black youth in the community. And in our first year, we were able to match 20 black <coughs> mentors with black youth. And as a matter of fact, tonight at the Big Brothers Big Sisters Gala, Sharon, Len, Mame, and the Black Community Advisory Council are actually going to receive an award for their investment in black youth. So I think that's, that's spectacular. they did was actually, with the support of the Region of Peel, commissioned the FACES research study to collect data and conduct a perception study amongst vulnerable black youth. And I want to be clear, not all black youth are vulnerable in our community. I think we can see, I think the Yippie program is an excellent illustration that we have some really <laughs> exceptional black youth in our community, as we do in all communities. But we also have some vulnerable black youth who have some real barriers to success. We want, as members of the Peel Children and Youth Initiative, Chair Evans and I are both, we want to remove barriers for all youth in our community so that all youth thrive. And I think that we're doing some really good work in our community, but there's always more that we can do from a quality improvement perspective. And Chair Williams, if I can use a car 
an, an automobile example, you know, we've got great cars, but there's uh, the automakers are always making improvements mm -hmm. to automobiles to make them more efficient, more effective, etc. And we want to do the same thing with our for in our community in terms of programs and services to support all of you in our community. So there are a number of recommendations in the FACES report, and Sharon is going to speak to us, not only for Peel Regional Police, but for the school boards and for the United Way and other funders. And we are taking this very seriously, and you're going to hear from Sharon not only about the recommendations for Peel Regional Police, but for the United Way as well, in terms of more work that we need to do. Um, United Way has been a long-term partner with Peel Regional Police. We've done great work together, I think, in the journey um, and in Colonial Terrace through our community policing model. I think the basketball camps program that Peel Regional Police does, the policing in the schools, and I think the Yippie program has been extremely motivating and shown us what we can do together as a community to ensure that all youth, and especially youth in our ethnocultural groups, are successful. So there's no, there's no doubt that more we can do more together for our children and youth in our community. I believe that together we are possibility. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sharon Douglas. Thank you, Shelley. Good morning, everybody. And good morning, Shelley said. And we're glad for the opportunity to be able to present on the FACES report this morning. As we, before I go in, I want to set up a little bit of the background context. Um, about two and a half years ago, what now has become known as the Danzig shootings in Toronto took place. Uh, the then Minister Hoskins did a series of community consultations. He came to the region of Peel and spoke to many of our members within the region. And one of the things we identified and discovered was that although we had a lot of anecdotal information, we did not have hard evidence that we as funders asked for, but many need to know to be able to have a conversation. There was a lack of infrastructure around how do we support the needs and what the gaps were there within the black community. Out of that, the Black Community Action Network and our United Way PCAC, the Black Community Advisory Council, held a community uh, meeting and invited, we had about almost 100 people there, at multi-neighborhood services to talk about what some of those gaps were, to talk about the lack of infrastructure, and to talk about some of the challenges, and also to figure out what would be some of the solutions. And it was out of those community conversations that the FACES Collaborative and this report was born. So, um, give you a very high level um, of the project deliverables and the background of the project. Our United Way, Shelley mentioned our United Way and our work and our commitment to diversity. Um, so, the project objectives were to examine the different social, economic, and environment and health aspects of the black population in Peel at a neighborhood level. It was also to focus and be proactive and responsive to the needs and the issues of marginalized and at-risk black youth around violence. Many of these reports, many of the recommendations and the findings we took from the roots of youth violence and a number of reports that were done in the region. Going back to, I went back to look, since 1996, based on our last census data, 2000, then again in 2004, then again in 2006, then again, on and on, there are about seven reports that focus specifically on the black community in the field. And when we looked at those recommendations as part of the literature review, you'll see them reflected. The deliverables were an establishment of a network of community stakeholders and community partners for the provision of support to the black community in Peel with an emphasis on black youth. No, go back a second. <laughs> I don't know how to go back. Yeah, oh, okay, I'll tell you what it is. So. That's okay. It was also to develop a strategic plan for the provision of system wide support for the black population, again, with a focus on black youth at risk at a neighborhood level. Yeah, okay, we're good. And there we are, okay. So, out of the project, there were... Thanks very much. Um, although the perception of data report fighting an uphill battle has received the most attention, there were three other really key reports that were also uh, delivered. One was a socioeconomic profile of the black population, looking between the 2006 last long-term uh, census and the 2011 National Household Survey. 
There was also a report number two, again, a socioeconomic status of black population, but at a neighborhood level. That, based on the last 2006 census data, because then we don't have to carry the data going forward. There was also an inventory of services of the black community in the region. Also a service, a gap analysis of what services were missing. And some of that information was taken from the stepping up report that was done by the province, by the Ministry of Our Children and Youth Services. And then the report, Fighting an Uphill Battle, which is a perception data report that spoke to youth, spoke to youth uh, service providers, parents, and other um, people working with black youth within the community. And it's the most recent. All these reports are the most up-to-date reports on what's happening with the black community in the world. These are some of our key findings. In between 2000 and 2011, 2001 and 2011, 116, 225 black people live in the region of Peel. It grew enormously. This is significant because it grew by 64% in this period of time, less than a 10 year period, or just about a 10 year period. The majority of the black population lives in Brampton, 60%, 39% live in the Mississauga, and 1% in Caledon. The black community is not homogeneous. Is not a homogenous group. 39% uh, immigrated from the Caribbean and 12% from Africa. Again, this is important because when we look at the Brampton population, where there's the largest segment of our black population, we're looking at Caribbean and youth from primarily Jamaica. In um, Mississauga, we're looking at continental Africa, and we're looking at Nigeria and a number of other countries within the continent. 43% uh, of blacks in Peel are Canadian born. Again, this has significance as we look at the kinds of programming and the kinds of conversations that we're having within the region and how we engage our youth and how we develop the programs and services that are needed um, to have them participate and thrive. Children and youth make up 44% of this 116,000 of the population. This is enormous because what we have is a fairly large youth population in the region of black youth who are getting ready to either enter in or are already in the system. Uh, between the ages of 15 to 24, they make up 17% of the population. 27% of our black population, youth population, is under the age of 15. That means, again, these kids are just entering into schools, they're entering into programs, if they're accessible, if they can get into them. And it has implications for if we want to turn the tide or we want to break the cycles of poverty and high unemployment and underemployment that we're seeing. Some of the qualitative findings indicate that many black youth in Peel feel unwanted, devalued, and socially isolated. Shelley mentioned the unemployment rate for black youth as being 29%, 10% higher than what our youth rate is right across. And unemployment is high for all youth, but in particular as we look at black youth here within the region. That's significant, again, given the size of the population. It also correlates really nicely to the data we have when we link and look at poverty and racialized communities and marginalized communities and newcomer communities. So this sort of reinforces some of that data, because then some of these kids are trying to take on some of the adult issues to support the family. Blacks earn on average 76 cents for every dollar a white worker earns. This came from uh, Dr. Grace Edward Galagos' report involved. 2011. There is a shortage of culturally appropriate and accessible programs and services needed to support black youth in Peel. And black youth also report that quite often they were unaware of the services that were available in the community. And we hear that quite often. That's not just specific to black youth, but uh, it was key for us. Black youth reported uh, feelings of isolation and marginalization in the public education system. Black youth are overrepresented in Canadian prisons, even as the incarceration rates of young men have steadily declined since the introduction of the Youth Criminal Justice Act in 2003. One contributing factor to the negative interaction between black youth and police, inaccessible safe recreational spaces for black youth due to fee charges, cost of public transportation, and this was taken from the Roots of Youth Violence report, which is reinforced, and we've heard and it's been repeated through many of the reports in the region. As Shelley mentioned, the recommendations were in three major groups, one for public institutions, which looked at education, police, municipal governments, community service organizations, and funders. So 
these are the recommendations, and I just pulled the recommendations that were specific to uh, our conversation here this morning. Mandatory training of police officers about the black community and culturally appropriate services. How do we interact? Hiring of more black police officers, and I know um, shortly after FACES uh, was released, our Black Community Advisory Council of the Peel Police, which is struck by Chief Evans, and we had a conversation about this yesterday, and we appreciate that, because one of the outcomes was that we wanted to be able to build an avenue and a mechanism where they would be able to have open and transparent conversations with our police force, so that we could begin to build a relationship of trust and understanding within the community. And so we welcome the opportunity. Thank you, Chief, for uh, striking that group and being able to open up conversations. Uh, review and the modification of practice of having police officers in schools. And I think this um, warrants just a, an extra line around the impact on black students. You have a group of our uh, community, I should say, who has a long history of mistrust with uh, our police right across the country, but we're talking about Peel right now. And so in the schools, as police officers prone and do their work and try to build relationships with the community and with the black youth, for some, they feel, for the kids, they're feeling, you know, we're suspicious, we're always looked at, and some of that could be their own perception, but it is their own perception. And if kids feel uncomfortable within that system, the recommendation is to review that and look at it and see, are there other ways that we could build that relationship, strengthen what that might look like within the school, and again, open up doors for conversation. And again, I need to say, yes, we've been having some of those conversations. Um, Data collection and public reporting on the interaction between police officers and the community, in particular issues of racial profiling. We're having lots of those right now, so I'll leave that. Um, the development of a systematic approach for regular and proactive consultation with the black community and field police. Again, through the establishment of the Black Community Advisory Council with our chief and our BCA, our Black Community Advisory Council and BN, Black Community Action Network, had a meeting yesterday with Chief Evans and uh, Superintendent Mumby. Was it yesterday or the day before? The day before. And talked at length about how do we build that relationship? What is the understanding and what is that mistrust within the community? And how entrenched that mistrust is. And the kinds of conversations we as parents need to have with our black youth as they go out into the community. And brainstorm some ways that we can sort of work together to help build that relationship and build that trust and to demonstrate that within the community as we move forward. Because at this point in time, what we need to do is say, okay, how do we move forward and how do we change this sort of ship? How do we turn it around? Both, from both perspectives. These are our recommendations for United Way that we are going to undertake internally as an organization. Um, and these were taken from the FACES report. There was a focus on an emphasis on commitment to the values of equity and inclusion, and that as funders, we look at this for funding proposals that come through. We are currently doing that. When we uh, released our new investment strategy about three years ago now, we have a very rigorous review um, process with an emphasis on diversity and collaboration, and we look at the financial of course, stability of the organization. We also use that same lens of equity, inclusivity, and collaboration around our neighborhood development strategy and our youth in action projects. And so we're already doing that work. What we believe is that we need to continue it and profile it a bit more so that the community knows that we are looking at that as an aspect of our work. We have a really active internal diversity and inclusion around committee that's doing a lot of work both internally and externally to reach out to the community, but also to build um, the partnership and the understanding and the awareness as we work within a multicultural environment in United Way. We come into our office, United Way 15 years ago, and United Way today is a, is a representation of the region. And so how do we continue to work together as a um, community and share and learn from one another? Also, the integration and alignment of work of the three community advisory, our four community advisory councils, as Shelly mentioned and link that work to our community investment strategy. So a great example, and we're very proud of the award we're going to receive this evening from uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters Appeal, is that they identified, Big Brothers um, Big Sisters came to the Black Community Advisory Council almost two years ago because they had identified that they had a number of black youth 
on their waiting lists, waiting to be paired up with mentors. But we're struggling in finding ways to engage the black community. And so came to BCAC and asked, could you help us? What do we need to do? Are there barriers in the way we're reaching out or profiling or, or engaging the community? And so we worked, a small group of the Black Community Advisory Council worked closely with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Peel to go through their screening process, their engagement process, their training process, and identify areas where there were gaps or where members of the black community may interpret it differently and also identify barriers that we could remove. But um, <laughs> thankfully, it's turned out to be a great success and it's uh, been wonderful so far. Actually, to the point where Ontario Trillium Foundation has also supported uh, the funding of the project for another year with the United Way. The other piece of our recommendation in turn is to increase and strengthen the investments to black human service organizations uh, to deliver programs and to build their capacity. As funders, one of the things we hear quite often is that many of our organizations are lacking in their capacity to be able to write solid proposals, to be able to come forward and deliver on there, and so we need to have build, help organizations build their capacity. We have a number of organizations within the region that are small grassroots, but are not able to get funding because they do not have the infrastructure that funders require. This would be a new project for United Way but it's one that we're hoping to undertake it and actually launch within the next couple of weeks as we pull together a number of organizations to talk about how do we work with you, how do we coordinate services to the black community based on some of the things that has come up of not only the FACES report, but the Roots of Violence um, report and all the previous reports. And the interesting thing is that the recommendations from each one of these reports continue to be carried forward and carried forward. And so, although we've done a huge amount of work in the region, there's still a huge amount of work to be done. And then the other one was the collection of equity data by funded organizations. Um, we started this over 18 months ago at United Way, which was a big step for us. Uh, we had some real, a lot of internal conversations around what did that mean, because collecting data around race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity is a really sensitive issue um, right across the board for all institutions, organizations, and funders. And so we did a lot of work internally, did some research, spoke with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, spoke to other organizations in Toronto and abroad that were actually collecting data, race, ethnicity data, and desegregating that data to be able to be used to tell us where we're going and what the gaps were within our programming. Um, we continue to do that, and, and what's really exciting about it is that as stewards of donor dollars, and we appreciate all of your donations to United Way, <laughs> as we're in campaign kickoff period time, <laughs> um, as stewards of those dollars, we want to ensure that the dollars we're investing in the community are getting to the people we want them to get to. Um, we want to ensure that where there are gaps in the community, we're able to identify them. And so one of the things we're talking about is universal program delivery versus targeted program delivery. Um, one of the best examples, and, and it may sound quite simplistic, but really this is what it is. You have one, two, three, four children. And then you have one child at one given point in time. Who, who's a little needier at that moment in time, at that period? And so what you do is you focus. You don't, you're not dropping the other three. You're not loving the other three any less. But what you're doing is you're working with this one child to get to the point that they need to. And as we use this data, this ethnicity data, this uh, sexual orientation, gender identity data, we're looking at how do we identify the gaps and bring everybody to a point where all of our youth in the community can thrive as opposed to just doing one blanket program. And another great example is like the Canadian Diabetes Association, or Heart and Stroke would say, there's a significant proportion within the black community or in the South Asian community that are experiencing diabetes more than the other communities. So instead of doing a blanket program for everybody, they spoke, focus in on the South Asian or the black or the Chinese community, because that's where the need is. And so with this data, this is what we're able to do, is to be able to say, these are gaps here, this is what we need to fill the gaps, and we feel that we're using the dollars wisely and we're storing these dollars wisely. 
Um, there was one other. <laughs> Hold on. Yes, so, yeah, that's okay. Um, yes, that's more for United Way's work. And so that's where we are at this point in time around the recommendations. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention in the very beginning is that the FACES Collaborative is made up of a number of community organizations. BCAN as one of our key partners, Aaron Mills Youth uh, Outreach Program, Peel Children's Aid Society, the Region of Peel, who funded this to the tune of about $34,000. Um, to help us get this uh, research done because of the lack of evidence within the community. And actually, who will be going back to for a phase two of funding to continue some of the recommendations in the region? Uh, who else did I miss? Beacon, Region Appeal, uh, Aaron Mills, Youth Appeal Children's Aid Society. They're all members around Rapport Youth uh, Counseling Services, Social Planning Council Appeal, are all members, and they're in the report. That's our faces for now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Connie. Thank you. I'm, I met with Shelley following the, uh, the, the, the faces report coming out. Um, and as I say, clearly, uh, I, I think we've been communicating a lot. I have the, I said on Twitter, from the meeting panel with uh, Shelley and with Sharon. But clearly, we have to improve our communications. Because it's like, although the recommendations I know to be made toward police were, are actually ongoing. Um, we talked about the officers in the school program. I know the board is aware of the fact that we have uh, engaged Dr. Darksbury from Carleton University to do a review of our school program. We now have a, an officer assigned to every high school, as well as uh, schools in the feeder schools as well. And we're analyzing the social return on the investment that we have made for the officers being in the schools. So, I mean, I think in, you say there are quite a few of the other recommendations are actually ongoing. We, uh, my Black Community Advisory Council started a few months ago. I know Sharon and Sophia from BCAN. We are meeting, talked the other day about community consultations, and clearly we need to have more meetings. So I, I welcome the report, and, then, and I welcome to continue working with them as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, I just wanted to say congratulations, Sharon. It was very informative, very telling report. I hope you have the opportunity to expand it, because I know there was really only a limited number of interviews being done, but I think 130 at the end of the day when you add it all up. And I know that only the most vulnerable youth were selected for, you know, for their interviews, but still we'd like to see it expanded. Um, there were some telling, um, some telling statistics, just the one that uh, black youth, unemployment for black youth at 30%. When the average in Peel is 17, that that's just something that I, the mayors will hope to try to address as well as somewhere where we can have some input and, and take action on our commitment. Um, and then obviously, what I wanted to also mention that um, Mrs. Arga takes uh, diversity and inclusion very seriously as well, and, and I want to thank Sharon for your role, who are serving as a stakeholder on that committee because of your vast knowledge on diversity and inclusion. So I want to thank you for that. Um, with respect to the uh, black population, so we have 30% unemployment, yet they represent 9%, 8% 8 of the population, I think you said in your in your report. Mm -hmm. The numbers are stark, are stark because given the size of the black population in the region, in comparison to the 1.3 million in the region, and as you mentioned, the unemployment rates, yeah, the numbers are, are stark. So as the report, um, looks deeper, the concern is what are those barriers? Why why are those numbers high? Um, you get the opportunity to attend the uh, Civic Action Boot Camp earlier yes. this year. Yes. And uh, from that we were able to gather more data than, and that trainings we know undertaking some work around focusing on marginalized and racialized youth. So we're interested in that and we're also yeah, no, Crumbia, I'd also like to add that, you know, as the demographics of Peel change, the fact that the black population has grown to be by 64%, I think by virtue of that fact alone, it, re it requires, this community requires some closer attention in terms of do we have the programs and services for our black community and for black youth, given that kind of population growth in that ethnocultural community. And I have noted those recommendations from my perspective as mayor, and we'll work together on that. But from, we're here today for Peel Police, so you make some recommendations for the police. And let me first say that I, you know, I, I'm 
a lot of respect for the work that she has done to be very visible in the community and having a number of advisory groups and committees, including a black community advisory council. But with respect to the recommendations for the police force, are there, you know, any that are more important than others? We've already, uh, she's already said she's already initiated some of them. Do you want to comment on the importance of prior, can you prioritize what you think are most important for the police force? Um, I'm pro if I, and this is my own personal thought, and I think the group may support, I think the training of police officers around the interaction of our community, um, and we've spoken about that a bit. Um, we've talked about, and we had an interesting conversation the day before, about if there's this entrenched mistrust and, and, and lack of issue, how do you hire black officers into you know the force? And so how do we communicate around that? How do we develop that? Um, the modification of the practice, I'm going to go through all five of them, um, of having police officers in the school, because I think it begins there. And so kids spend an awful lot of time within the schools. And so if it turns out to be an interaction that's extremely positive within there, as we see with many of the kids, not all of the kids, are having that experience, then I think, again, it turns the tide, because it's word of mouth. It's what that child goes back home and says to mom and dad. It's what that child experiences with their partners and their peers within the school. So I think probably the first three would be top as a community where I think as BCAN and BCAC and a number of other community partners, we can work together to, uh, to have some conversations. And then you do talk a lot about the issue of trust. Yes. And how it can be eroded and how critical it is to establish relationships in the community with the police force. You actually make the comment that black youth are recording their distrust of the police do a large part of racial profiling and the fact that police tend to stop blacks from questioning more than other groups. And we know from your statistics, if you're 9% of the population, and I know the chief has made a report to us saying that this happens 21% of the time. So, so what other recommendations do you have around establishing trust? Well, that would be one of the conversations that we would need to have. And again, we talked about this uh, the other day when we met and through the establishment of the Chiefs Committee. Um, how do we communicate what police officers are doing? And again, that comes from the training that they would receive. And although I know police officers receive diversity and I think training, we work very closely with the Diversity uh, Bureau and have worked with them for a number of years. But it's that interaction on the street that creates the challenges and the problems. So I think training there, training on both sides for the youth, so as our youth begin to understand the role of police officers, because we all want to be safe. Of course. The black community course. doesn't want to be any less safe than any That's other community. That's why we're here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we want the officers to be able to do their work, but at the same time, there's a way of respect and, 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 not, and people not feeling like, oh my god, why am I the only one out of the group that you're picking on? or why I'm the one that's always stopped more often than anybody else, or why am I, if I'm in school, why am I the one that you talk to as opposed to, you know, there's a group of us. And so some of it is, you know, kids living real life experiences around that. And I, I think the training around that um, culturally appropriate, how to work within the black community, and understanding <laughs> the nuances and, and, and the, the depth of that fear and mistrust that that lives within the black community around policing because so many of the interactions have been negative. Many have been positive, but many have been negative. And so how do we how do we begin to shift that? It won't happen overnight. Just the final comment and question for you is um, the issue of, you know, I, I was reading the um, uh, Ombudsman report last night. He spoke a lot about police disrespecting you and how it could lead to stigmatization is continuing. So if they continue to be profiled in any way, repeatedly um, they felt that, you know, it led to things like anxiety and depression and stigmatization. I wonder if you might speak to that. Absolutely. I, I'm, again, I can only tell a personal story to really emphasize the point. Um, my youngest son, I'm sharing with people, I call one Martin, I call the other one uh, Malcolm, because <laughs> they're two totally different personalities. Well, one of the things my youngest son says, who likes to really shop and you know, dress, is that when he goes in the store, he said, Mom, I hold the things up in my hand so that people can see I'm not trying to stuff anything in my pockets. So that when they follow me around the store, they know I'm not trying to steal. 
you know. Or my younger son will say, when I get in my car, I take off my baseball cap, I take off everything so I look like what the perception or the understanding is an upstanding student is or a young man is. And so when you start your day off thinking, I'm already suspicious, the impact of that internally on our youth, on our families, on our adults, not just our black youth, our adult males and adult females, but primarily males. It demoralizes, it depresses, it, it creates an air of suspicion. Um, you just feel uncomfortable, so your back's already up because you're already nervous. And if you walk through your life like that every day, then I'm not surprised that we are where we are when you feel that discomfort on a regular basis. It had, impacts every part of your life. I had the opportunity to meet Desmond Cole and he shared the exact same example. He couldn't walk into a high-end store without being approached no, and followed. Not at all. So how do we overcome it? <laughs> That's been a lifelong question in the black community. Um, Can I just add something here? Yes. I think that the question that you had, uh, that you asked Mayor Crombie, really demonstrates the complexity of this issue. And certainly, Peel Regional Police has a role to play in this. But with the black community being such a large part of our community, there's certainly work that needs to take place in the community as well, in terms of working with black families and black youth, also to support the building of their capacity, and the building of their confidence, and the building of their opportunities. So it really does need to be a collaboration between Peel Regional Police and organizations like the United Way investing in programs and services to support black families, black youth, etc. And that's what we've said in our report, and that's what Sharon has made abundantly clear, is that right now, at this point in Peel's history, our community needs to make some additional investments in building the capacity of the black human services in our community. And we need our community support to do that. I acknowledge I certainly have a role in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for being here. Um, you, you are, um, you're eloquent, uh, you're a good spokesperson, and uh, you are so right about all the countless reports. Uh, you must be tired of reading them because uh, they bring a message that uh, speaks to the challenges they're troubling finding, and I think. Um, we're not at our best when not everybody can access the same kind of opportunities. So uh, I think you provide some very practical recommendations. And uh, I think we as a board want to hire differently. And we're, we're going to be exploring ways that we can do that better. Um, what you tell us about what's happening in the schools is a new uh, observation that I hadn't thought of before. So that's interesting. Uh, with regards to your recommendation about the data <coughs> and public reporting, we'll be talking about that in other issues, I think, later today. And um, I think I would agree with, with um, Mayor Crombie that our chief has been very proactive on this front. Uh, she's been in the trenches a lot on this issue, and, and we support her doing the difficult work that, in, in those tough conversations that have to take place, but, but I appreciate that she's doing it. and. Uh, we want to continue that role. So we're here as a police services board, but we all own a piece of this. And and, and I can assure you that my council, uh, along with the uh, Saga Council, will work to find ways that we can collaborate and uh, make some of those um, reports and findings uh, something that uh, we hope in the next report is better. We want to move the bar up for everybody. Thank you. They actually allowed me to speak last. <laughs> I, I really want to applaud our chief for the work she is doing out with our community and meeting with everyone. I also want to thank the board for the work they're supporting and especially to have you here today to speak to the FACES report. I have spoken to you, Sharon and, Sh and Shelley, and, and I'm a part of that and I feel for the community. So for today, what I would like to do is put forward a resolution on your recommendations and see whether the board would support this because as outlined, I have lived in Peel for over 40 years and the population and diversity has changed. 
I am out there every day speaking to youth and I see and hear their perceptions. And yes, I support that we need to work with parents and youth, but we also need to collaborate with everyone who is engaged with them. Um, one of my passion from having managed healthcare at the Roy McMurtry Youth Center and seeing so many black children being incarcerated there, my passion every day is to see some changes for our youth. They are our future. Uh, they are our future and without them, what will our community be like in the future? Um, police officers are out there to work with them, but as you say, maybe retraining, additional training. Whatever the board needs to support, we need to collaborate and really grow in a positive way. So my resolution today is whereas the Peel Police Services is currently undertaking a review of the practice of carding known in Peel as street checks, and whereas the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services is currently undertaking a review of the practice of carding, and whereas the 2015 FACES report, FACES for those who are not familiar with the acronym is Facilitating Access, Change and Equity in Systems. So whereas the 2015 FACES report of Peel Report on the social well-being of black youth in Peel region made specific recommendations to Peel police to address the realities of a highly racialized population. Therefore, be, be resolved that Peel police require mandatory training for police officers about members of racialized groups. Be it resolved that Peel Police commit to hiring more visible minority police officers. Be it resolved that Peel Police review the practice of having police officers in schools and provide recommendations to the Police Services Board taking into consideration the impact on young black youth. Be, be resolved that Peel Police develop a systematic approach for regular and proactive consultation with the black community and table it for the Peel Police Services Board to review and approve. So that is a motion and a resolution that I am I'm making on behalf of President. Basically, it cuts off the face of the board, which is uh, training of police, uh, hiring of more uh, black youth, uh, schools, and consultation. Uh, I do want to underscore one point, which is I don't want this to be taken as if the Peel Region Police is starting from a stationary point. That the Chief Evans, in particular, and, 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 and the Peel Police in general have been working on those four areas for a long time. And Board is very cognizant of that. So I would just want to underscore that the Chief been doing a lot of work. And what your report has done is a good service in giving us a refresher and review it. And I think what we want to do is energize these four areas, which are already progressing forward. I know she's been consulting with the um, black community in the last few weeks and even longer. And I do know how much time she spends outside. So we want to continue that. So this resolution is to address the four key Trust that you had in your faces report, and I'm very happy to second it. Thank you, Chief. Comments? No, I think yeah, I, I, I'm all for future training, Ms. Say, and I say, yeah, Sharon, we've had those discussions, and I say, I, I, I will be able to implement those, and I'll report back to the board. Thank you very much. Thank you.